Why don't we just go ahead and pray? Let's do that right now. Father in heaven, thank you for calling us here today to remind us that you've called us to tell somebody about Jesus. You've given us life eternal, life after this life, life that never ends. You've given us eternity in the presence of the redeemed with the, the patriarchs and the prophets of old. You've given us a oneness with your own self that will last throughout eternity's unending ages. I pray that as a result of us being here today, we might desire more to have you. We might desire more to, to, to have less of the distractions of the world and more of the things of heaven. We want to drink deeper of the things of eternity. So encourage us now, speak to us and bless us now, we pray, not because we are worthy, but because we need you and we desire to have a heaven in the center of our lives. Bless us now, we pray, for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, please say with me, amen, amen and amen. I have a nephew, I, in fact, I have multiple nephews, nephews and great-nephews and great-great-nephews and the whole thing. Um, some of the branches got off to an early start, so when my, my mother died, she was a great-great-grandmother. She didn't get off to an early start, but... Some of her descendants did. But I have this one nephew. In fact, he's on the other side of the family. And he is um, training to be a pastor. He's at the seminary right now. In fact, right now, uh, doing summer classes at the present point in time. He lived with us for a little while when he was at college because we live not too far away from the university, you know. And uh, he bought himself a car. Now, when I say a car, it was a, it was a student car. It was the most student car looking student car in the history of student cars unsurprisingly when he bought the car he discovered it had a slight odor to it an odor and so he came to us he said uh, in fact he asked my wife auntie melissa do you have anything or do you know how i could get an odor out of this car and she said yes and I knew what was coming next. Some years ago, when we were on the road traveling, we stayed in a place that had a little funny smell about it. We mentioned it to someone. They said, oh, well, we've got the, the answer for you. And they mentioned to us that they had just the appliance we needed to remove strange odors from places that they're not desired. It was a box about this big. <clears throat> had a fan on the inside. You're thinking, an ozonator. No, it was nothing like an ozonator. I don't know what it was. A box with a fan. They said, plug that in, get it running, and it'll take care of all your problems. We plugged it in, we got it running. Several days later, it had taken care of no problems. In fact, it gave us a problem. What are we going to do with this useless box? My idea was to put it in the dumpster. The kind people who gave it to us said, we don't need it back. Of course they didn't. It was useless. <laughs> But Melissa put it in storage someplace. And so when Aaron, the nephew, came along and said, do you have something? The little light bulb. You can actually see the light bulb above her. You can see it. Have I got a great idea? Aaron, this will do the job. Oh, really? Thanks so much. He's a little gullible, is our nephew. And so he took that thing and he plugged it, got an extension cord, parked the car in the garage, plugged an extension cord and attached it to the, the useless box put that in his car shut the door on it set it running and uh he said how long and uh my wife said oh you know go, go back a few hours later or whatever the next day he shut that appliance off he was quite excited opened up the door of the car there had been zero change he went to my wife and he asked the question of questions he asked her does this thing work now there's a question ladies and gentlemen does this thing work every few moments there's another thing that comes along now i mean no offense but if you take offense that's okay with me you remember a few years ago everybody started fronting up a church and i don't mean everybody but at churches all over the place there'd be at least one person wearing a copper bracelet remember those you might have one on today if you do Pull your sleeve down, because I, I don't mean to offend you. But the copper bracelet's going to fix everything. It's going to stop you from wetting the bed. It's going to get rid of your warts. You won't snore anymore. You'll be taller, better looking, healthier. You'll be able to run a marathon uphill. 
copper bracelet will fix it all. I looked at those things and I wondered about the science of that. And I would ask, um, so how does that work? That's not the right question to ask someone wearing that because they don't know. They've just been told it's the magic bullet. They put it on and they hope it'll take care of everything. How does that work? Well, actually, it's because of, it's because of, and it sounds more like voodoo than anything. And so I wondered, does, does, does this thing work? I think it's a fair question to ask. Colloidal silver, that'll cure everything from COVID to AIDS to, to ADD, everything. Just mix this stuff up. Someone's getting rich, but you drink the stuff and you'll it, it'll remove anything and everything. And I know somebody from the Colloidal Silver Anti-Defamation League is going to rush me later. You're thinking of doing it right now. Stop that man. I've told everybody about this. I've got a question for you. Does this thing, if, if it works for you, then God bless you. If it works for you. Do you remember 20 years ago, everybody started drinking barley grass. Remember that? Now, barley grass tastes like it should work. <laughs> it tastes like sin. I remember during, I think we've still got some in the plastic container at home, half high in the pantry, way at the back. We don't want anybody to see it. It probably works in some degree because it's green and green stuff's really, really, really good for you. But the first time I drank it, ah, I about turned inside out. Somebody said, oh, no, no, you should mix it with orange juice. Anything that needs to be mixed with orange juice just to get it down. Already, I'm wanting to do this. It's, it's not the right stuff. Now, I didn't say it doesn't work, but I would ask the question. Does this thing work? And so a few years ago, I came home and I do a lot of the laundry, you know, and I went to the laundry room and opened up the dryer and there were three little round balls in there covered in spikes. They looked like something that should dangle from a gladiator's chain. <laughs> hey, hon, what are these? Oh, oh, they're, they're dryer balls. Well, yeah. What do they do? Oh, they make the dryer work better. <laughs> How does that happen? Well, they stop the laundry <clears throat> from clumping up and they allow the air to circulate more freely and they're just the thing that we need. I, was, I had no idea that the dryer did not work efficiently. I thought it worked really quite well. But I've learned that we needed to make it more efficient. <clears throat> But you know, gentlemen, you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. <laughs> you've got to know when to walk away and know when to run. <laughs> and on this occasion, I simply said, yes, dear. And I used them. I didn't want to take them out lest I looked obstreperous or ornery or disagreeable. I just left them in there. And I thought, whatever doesn't seem to be hurting anyone. I think we have one left, one of them broken to pieces because they got used and used and literally used into oblivion. You will not believe how disappointed I was because I wondered every time I put clothes in the laundry, I thought, I feel like a sucker. I feel a little bit like we got taken, but you know, whatever, no one's getting hurt, no one died, no one's health was jeopardized. Just roll with it, man. At least your wife thinks this is the thing. I wondered again and again, do these things work? No, 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 no. I didn't wonder that. I never wondered if they worked. I was convinced from the outset that they were useless. Never was a question of my mind. So one day, in preparing for this actual sermon, I went online and I asked the question of Google, do these things work? And you will not believe how absolutely crestfallen I was to discover that according to the experts, they increase the efficiency of your dryer by up to 18%. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that. Probably the people who make those little things. <laughs> but it is a wise question to ask. Does this thing work and so i would like to pose that question today what we do in response to the question actually will determine the answer so what am i talking about today 
Not these things you place in the dryer. I'm not worried too much about that thing you wear on your wrist. If you believe it's making you stronger and better and bigger and better. That's on you. But let me take you back a couple of hundred years. Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists in these United States adapted what they had learned from Christians in England and Scotland and met outdoors for large religious meetings along the American frontier. Well, what happened at these meetings? A Presbyterian preacher named John McCready described what happened on a camp meeting or at a camp meeting back in the year 1800, 223 years ago. Listen to what he said. I'm reading for you. He said, No person seemed to wish to go home. Hunger and sleep seemed to affect nobody. Eternal things were the vast concern. Here, awakening and converting work was to be found in every part of the multitude. He goes on and talks about sober professors. I think that's another way of saying nominal believers. He said, nominal believers started saying, I've been a nominal believer. I have been a communicant only. Oh, I see that religion is a sensible thing. I feel the pains of hell in my soul and body. Oh, how I would have despised any person a few days ago who would have acted like I'm doing now. But oh, I cannot help it. He goes on to write, little children, young men and women and old gray-headed persons, persons of every description, white and black. And I found that interesting at a camp meeting in the American South 223 years ago. White and black were to be found in every part of the multitude, crying out for mercy in the most extreme distress. People back then would come to camp meeting in their thousands, and large numbers of people, as a result, were converted. It wasn't until 1868 that Seventh-day Adventists gathered for the first Adventist camp meeting. It took place on the farm of one E.H. Root in an area called Wright, Michigan, about 10 miles out of Grand Rapids. And since then, we've been holding camp meeting in virtually every corner of the vineyard all around the world and certainly all across the Fruited Plain. You heard our brother last night testify that he'd been coming to this camp meeting now 35 camp meetings in a row and that's wonderful man that's wonderful camp meeting takes an immense amount of planning you know huge reserves of energy a lot of time and a lot of money and so i want to unashamedly ask the question today does this thing work and i'm not asking from a position of doubt I am asking to awaken inquiry. What would be the measure of whether or not camp meeting works? You might think our answer would of necessity be arbitrary. But I don't think that's true. Let's ask ourselves, what is camp meeting? The answer is, it is a spiritual convocation. It's a time to come together and focus on the Word of God. What's the point? Well, surely the point must be our transformation. Surely the point of camp meeting has to be our growth in the grace of Almighty God. Surely it must. Surely the point of camp meeting has to be that we become more like Jesus. You might think that the point of camp meeting for you is your annual visit to the ABC. Chance to load up on bulk veggie food and and as it you might be thinking we have to have a larder full of veggie links and fried chick that's what camp meeting is all about you might be thinking camp meeting is those seminar classes we go to during the day camp meeting is the speakers we hear here preaching the sermons you might be thinking Camp meeting is a chance to catch up with old friends. It's a bit like a family reunion. It's a kind of a vacation. 
And man, that's okay. None of those things are harmful. I would say all of those things are relatively good, if not even more so. They're fine. Of course they are. But camp meeting has to be about more than that. Must be. We've been holding camp meeting here and in this conference for decades. You know, I get around to a few camp meetings. There's one I've been to several times where there has been for 60 years one family holding lunch in the same place. By now they've got the big shelter out. It's a big affair. Dozens, maybe even scores of people attend that lunch. It's a highlight for those that are in the inner circle. They've been doing that lunch unbroken every single year, every single camp meeting for 60 camp meetings. It's good too. If I can wangle an invite back to that camp meeting one day, I know where I'm heading Sabbath at lunchtime. That's a great tradition and God bless them. And I'm not speaking against it. I think it's wonderful. But I wonder if it's possible that we could come to camp meeting for the fun and the food and the fellowship and go away from here no closer to Jesus than we were when we arrived. Friend of God, camp meeting was given to us by God so that we could grow our faith, so that we could be converted, strengthened, reconverted if need be. And so we have to ask ourselves, does this thing work? What's the point of our faith if it is not changing us? We have not been called by God to be secular wolves masquerading around in the clothing of a Christian sheep. We have not been called by God to be worldly people with a Christian sticker affixed to the bumper of our lives let's turn in our bibles to romans chapter 12 and we'll start in verse 1 romans chapter 12 and verse 1 let's look at what the apostle writes romans and chapter 12 and we will begin in verse 1 this is quite the passage because as you know the book of romans is quite the book Paul begins this chapter of the book of Romans and you'll note that Romans deals with faith and justification by faith with becoming one with God saved delivered from our sins more like Christ transformed and so after 11 chapters where he's talked about now being justified by faith we have peace with God he has spoken about the wretched man that he was. He's spoken about Abraham and what faith looked like and what faith was in the experience of Abraham. And now he gets down to chapter 12 and he writes, Therefore, well, it begins in my Bible, I beseech you, therefore. But I'm looking at the therefore. Based on what we have read hitherto, all that about Abraham, all that about the gospel being the power of God unto salvation. All that Romans chapter 7, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he gives the answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. And then Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Wow! Those are, some of the, those are some of the greatest words in all of literature. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Stack that up against Romans 8 and verse 1. And Paul beats Dickens by a country mile. I don't know how much Shakespeare you read. I'm not prescribing it for you. But if you've read, you knew that that brother knew how to handle a pen. That man had a great command of the English language. He wrote some profound stuff in those many books and plays that he wrote. But you can find the most sublime Shakespeare poetry or prose. And it will never even hold a candle to Romans 8 and verse 1. Paul has written some profound things. And he says, 
Therefore, based on what we've been looking at up until this point, I beseech you, brethren. Now, he didn't say, hmm, consider with me. He didn't say, I wonder if you'd be so kind. He said, I beseech you, but I don't want to stretch that word to breaking point. But he was saying, I'm appealing to you. I implore you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm appealing to you now, my brothers and my sisters. By the mercies of God, he's given us 11 chapters. He's come to this place now. We are climbing here in Romans. And he gets to this place. He said, based on all we've looked at, I'm appealing to you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Come on now, think about that with me. The sacri- now, there were a v- variety of sacrifices. Not all of them were animal sacrifices. They took down lambs and they took goats and they took all kinds of things. No, I shouldn't say. Didn't take a menagerie of, of creatures down there. But when it came to the burnt offering, the burnt offering was placed on the altar of, of sacrifice, or burnt offering rather, and was burnt up. That sacrifice was completely consumed. And he says... I appeal to you based on all of this that I've written so far. All of that about faith. All of that about conversion. All of that about the Messiah. I beseech you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. What he's saying is, friends, I'm appealing to you to place it all on the altar. He has said you may be justified by faith. You may be separated from your sin, from its penalty, from its power. You may be separated from the presence of sin by faith. And now he's saying, let's put some walking shoes on this faith. What I really mean when I'm saying faith. What I really mean when I'm talking about being justified by faith. Let me, ex- let me explain that for you in graphic terms. What I mean is that if you are to be justified by faith, you are to present your body, you are to present your life as a living sacrifice. Everything placed on the altar. Elder Zill spoke earlier on about offering and pastor jimmy got up here and talked about offering and elder bailey spoke about offering and had to say felt they had to say i'm not even apologizing for asking for money nor should you because at the end of the day no even at the beginning of the day none of your money is your money come on now whose is it it's god's money so so god is simply saying would you flick back to me some of what I've given to you. When the offering plate comes around in church, that's worship time. We are giving to God his own. It's all his, you understand. Let me digress here and just, just speak about your money. Let me tell you about money. I've pondered this. I've considered this. Often, most of us have the most money we've ever had when we die. Right? You die, you leave your home and you leave whatever's in the bank account and this and that and the other. If your life was really a living sacrifice, what would it look like in death? Now, many have said, do your giving while you're living. I can't, I'm not against that. That's wonderful. But what happens when you die? Let me paint a scenario for you. I'm not plucking this out of life, a real life experience, but I'm, I'm sure it's real enough. Somebody dies and they've got two kids. So being as the average age of checking out in this country is around 80, we're going to say that the person died at 80. Their two children, if they were 80, tell me how old their kids were. They've got a son and a daughter. How old were those two kids? Died at 80. The kids are how old? Exactly right. They're 55 and 57. Because they had the kids at 23 and 25. 55 and 57. And so now, dad, who by now is grandpa, leaves his home. Now, depending on where you live in the United States, your home might be worth a whole lot more than it was when you purchased it. Now, not every area in the United States has met with the same amount of uh, appreciation in the real estate market. That's absolutely true. But it may be that you bought a home for 80000 or 110000 You might have paid 60000 way back in the day. And when you check out, your home's now worth three eighty or four hundred. dollars In fact, I don't know what the real estate market's like where you live, so I'm going to take it up a little notch and say that the home you bought when you check out of here was $500,000. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think that Elon Musk gets turned on by thinking about half a million dollars, but half a million dollars, a lot of money. Half a million dollars can do a lot for the Lord, except you decided that you were going to leave your house to the kids. I need to ask you a question. Your son is 55 and your daughter is 57. What do they need a quarter of a million dollars for? No, no, genuine question. Now you might say, oh, my son has spent his entire life in the mission field. And he came back flat, busted, broke. Okay, okay, okay. But that's a one in a million. I would say to you that if your daughter at the age of 57 needs a quarter of a million dollars, if your son needs a quarter of a million dollars at the age of 55, that's a big problem. I don't know what's been going on in their lives that they're hanging out for a quarter of a million dollars. Clearly, they have fumbled the ball. Certainly, you're going to tell me, oh, my daughter, her husband divorced, she had these kids. Okay, okay, that's the exception. I'm not speaking to the exception. I'm speaking to the rule. Do you know how many souls can be won with that kind of money? Do you know what the Mountain View Conference could do with that kind of money? You're going to die. We're all going to die. And that property is going to be left to somebody. Now, right now, there's some kids, 20, 25, 30, here. you're really, really nervous. <laughs> Don't tell them that. Well, I have advice for you, 20, 25, 30-year-old. Get an education. Work hard. Make your own way. Don't sponge off the death of your parents. Live with a little more integrity than that. Look, you die, leave your son the ride-on mower. <laughs> He'll love that. You go on these, uh, 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 not Kawasaki, Husqvarna, zero turn. They, you can drive that thing on the freeway and leave people behind. <clears throat> he will love that. And leave him 10,000 bucks so he and his wife can take a holiday in Greece. That's it. The daughter, I don't know, what is she, I don't know what she wants. Leave her, leave her whatever the, the female equivalent of the ride on mower is. I didn't stop to think that through. <laughs> Maybe she wants the ride on mower. This is equal opportunity preaching today. <laughs> leave her a few grand. You got some grandkids, I don't know what their needs are. Come on now. We are either a living sacrifice or we're not. Right? You die and you say to God, oh no, you can't have this. I want to keep that. I'm going to give it for my kids who ain't even in the church. You must well just give it straight to the devil. That's not how we live if we're living sacrifice. It is God's. It ain't mine. It ain't yours. You want to get to heaven and know, man, after I died, we raised up two or three congregations. I left my house, gave it to the Lord. Look at what he did. There were churches that came up out of nothing because the seed money was provided and some Bible workers were employed and a minister was employed and resources were purchased. Come on now, we are thinking way too small. We are God's. All we have doesn't mean that you can't spend your money on nice stuff. And you know, I didn't even want to make that apology. You understand what I mean. You want to have a nice house, a nice car, go nice places. That's all good. You do that. But remember, it is God's, not yours. He calls us to be a living sacrifice. And surely I mean beyond just our possessions and our finances. I just picked on that to make a point. It is all God's. Present your bodies, your life as a living sacrifice. You are alive but dead. Dead to sin. Dead to the world. Alive unto Christ through Jesus Christ our Lord. Holy. Acceptable unto God. Now man, this preacher is talking about laying it all on the altar. Telling God it's all his and he can do whatever he wants. You tell God with your life, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll live where you want me to live. I'll marry who you want me to marry. Always works out better that way, ladies and gentlemen. I'll, 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 I'll be in the church. I won't work on the Sabbath. Of course I'll follow the health principles. These are the things that you want for me. I've got a temper. I yield that to you again, Lord. I'm proud. Take my pride away. Living sacrifice. All given to God. And that sounds radical. Except Paul says it isn't. 
He says, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He writes this letter to the Romans and he says, in case you think this is a little bit far out, I'm telling you it's reasonable. And if you were to look in the Greek, incredible. That word reasonable is the Greek word logikos. It's the word logical. Paul is saying it's logical to live completely committed to Jesus. Of course it is. Jesus was completely committed to us. And he asks for our whole heart. We're not happiest until we've given him our whole heart. Not happiest. We aren't content. We aren't cleansed. We aren't pure. We aren't settled until Jesus has everything we got. It's rational to yield everything to God. Irrational to do otherwise. It's reasonable. Unreasonable not to. It is logical in the words of the apostle himself. That means it is illogical not to make your whole life the possession of God. Oh, I understand. That's a growing thing. We'll talk about that later and tonight. We're growing. You, you, you don't step up with a ball and a racket and serve an ace first time. No one does that. We've got to grow in this. But Paul says, this is your reasonable service. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot afford to take God anything less than seriously. You don't want to be half in, half out. One foot in the church, one foot in the world. Now, I'm not talking to the person who has a struggle going on. You're growing. We understand that. Thank God. Bring your struggles to church. Bring your dysfunction to church. God will grow you through that. But man, it doesn't make any sense at all not to be all in with the one who was all in for you. Do not be conformed to this world. Have mercy. It's a battlefield out there. The world has never pressed upon people, especially young people, with the ferocity that it is pressing with now. It is a minefield, this world. And so Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. Kids today, of all ages, with their 14, 44, 84, bending in the direction of the world, being bent out of shape. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How might we be transformed? By the renewing of your mind. Give that mind to God. Invite Jesus to live his life in you. Your mind will be renewed. You will be changed. You will be transformed that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, God is calling to us today that we might have a faith that works. Now you can be a legalist if you want. I hope you won't be, but you can be. It's America. You get to choose you can be a legalist, and there are some of those. You can be a sensationalist, like the Athenians, spending your time and nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Oh, yeah. It does bother me that even in our, in our midst, we have so many conspiracy theorists. Now, I know it's been said with some justification that the difference between a conspiracy theory and the truth is like six months. Understand that. <laughs> Understand that. But whatever your conspiracy is, whether it's the Illuminati or whether it's the Jesuits or whether it's the, the, the what's that, the, the Davos people, I do know what that's called. We've spoken about those guys. The, the World, Economic, uh, World Economic Forum or Bill Gates, who somehow wants to murder seven and a half billion people, so there's only half a billion people left on the earth? Really? Really? No. no. Friend of God, whatever your, little, whatever your little intellectual kink is, I think that's fair. Yeah. Whatever your little intellectual kink is, you're welcome to it. But it isn't the gospel. It's not the message. I've read the three angels' messages once or twice. I never read about the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, Jesuits, nothing. In, well, you could argue that one. In the three angels' messages. 
haven't read about a conspiracy theory in the three angels message there is a great conspiracy in heaven long ago a perfect god was conspired against by a devil who wanted to take his place and ever since satan has been conspiring against god now as i said you're welcome to your beliefs and as i said i said uh sometimes some conspiracy theories turn out to be uh, not so conspiratorial after all but please ladies and gentlemen can we keep this in context and can we keep it in perspective can we make the main thing the main thing and the main thing is christ and him crucified that's the main thing church and the context of church that's not for any of that stuff you can do that in your own time don't evangelize with the crazy stuff evangelize with jesus so you can be a legalist and you can be a sensationalist you can be a progressive whatever that is <laughs> always pushing the envelope reinventing the message redefining the faith once delivered to the saints but ladies and gentlemen we have to be better than that we have to be more than that you know pluralism has helped us as a church you can be off 10 percent 20 percent 80 percent but you man there's room for you under the tent so through pluralism we have papered over the cracks and that was okay when the cracks were just cracks but when the cracks become fissures and then the cracks become gaping chasms that pluralism will end us end up biting us right on the spiritual backside it's a fascinating thing the way culture impacts the church now culture should impact the church to a degree to a degree to a degree but we see right now I'm not going to go ahead and, 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 and be specific but you can be as specific as you as you want you know that right now the culture is affecting us in a dramatic way culture is changing like we've never seen it change before so that things that we once were just out and and loud and proud about say well that's sin now we don't want to say that because it's not politically correct and you've got to tread a little bit warily because you don't want to be offensive you don't want to upset people families are wrestling with all kinds of things ladies and gentlemen i have to tell you this when culture conflicts with the bible we must follow the bible Amen. that doesn't mean we ought to be mean Amen. mean isn't biblical we shouldn't be offensive for the sake of being offensive there are some people when it comes to being brutally honest they find a lot more joy in the brutality than they do in the honesty and that's not right but friend of god we must stand against the culture in our churches we've got to be christian in our schools we cannot be bent by the culture and our schools are under immense pressure for varying reasons but they must stand tall and stand straight in our message in our preaching in our bible studies we must not be anything other than biblical jesus was biblical always loving he was earnest but never vehement he was never needlessly offensive of course some people took offense when he said i am the bread of life but that would be on them and not on jesus come on now we've got to be all in with jesus all in with the bible all in with the message we ought to be more biblical today than we were in 1863 when we were founded as a church because we are on the edge of a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation and there are so many people today oh come on i'm gonna make a change i think there are so many people today whose faith will fold like a deck chair the minute it's pressed or pushed doesn't need to be that way because christ in you is truly the hope of glory friend can we commit to the bible i gotta say this again that doesn't mean being mean doesn't mean being intolerant doesn't mean being judgmental it means being christ-like but standing on the bible can you say amen today amen. and the bible would change your heart when you're all in with jesus i gotta tell you something saul the persecutor arrested by jesus on his way to damascus he was breathing out threatenings and slaughterings god got him just like that and changed his heart and heart jail keeper in acts chapter 16 this man was a hard man 
But God got hold of his heart and that brother was changed and transformed and his household. Look, do we go away from camp meeting having encountered the Spirit of God? Uh, do we go away with a little more spiritual steel in our spine? Do we go away with our hearts throbbing with the love of Jesus? Do we leave this place more compassionate? We see the lost and the erring and the confused. There's so many confused people. Do we have compassion for them? Pity for them? Or do you just want to boot them out or, or down? No, 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 no. Adventists are not those people. We are compassionate. We are loving. We are gracious because that's who Jesus is. Are we praying in the morning? Did you pray this morning? Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. If you didn't, I want to ask you kindly why you didn't. Because if you didn't, what you did pray, your prayer of omission was, I don't really need you today. When I get into a jam, I'll take it. I don't need the Holy Spirit to do nothing for me. When I'm tempted, you can trust me, I'm fine, because I had a little prayer this morning. No, come on now, we ought to be praying every day, every day. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. We are not safe unless we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are wretched. We are humans. We are sinners. We're sinful. We must be filled with the Spirit of God. Lord, bless me with your Spirit. Lord, speak to me somehow today, even if I don't like that preacher, even if I wear one of them things around my wrist. Help me to take something away from the sermon. That's a blessing today. I we praying those prayers at camp meeting are we taking the opportunity to pray with others to pray for others this isn't a glorified picnic Amen. this is a spiritual convocation where we come to encounter Christ I bet you and I, I bet you as someone who doesn't bet but if you would be able to withdraw from this earth and then look through God's eyes this whole Valley Vista area would glow as God looks at the world he would say this is a hot spot right here this is where my people come where my spirit waits where angels tread we are here to draw close to the God of heaven to learn how to see through his eyes Conferences wrestle with budgets and finances and making ends meet and trying to stretch dollars to go further. And they do camp meeting. Camp meeting is mission. Yes, it's a chance to communicate. It's important to focus on evangelism. But God forbid that camp meeting should meekly devolve into a shell of what it really ought to be. And of course, my point isn't just camp meeting. Well, I came to camp meeting to hear a promotion for camp meeting. That would be circular. I'm, I'm leaning into my point here. And my point, friend, is faith. We cannot just be going through the motions, can we? This church can never go through the motions. Our Sabbath schools have got to be places where we study the Bible. Places to which we can invite people. Hey, we've got a small group every Sabbath morning, Saturday morning. Why don't you come? Invite them. Church has got to be a place where we feed on the Word of God. Our schools must be places where our young people are impacted powerfully by Jesus and truth and the Holy Spirit. We cannot let church become some kind of club. I know that not everybody wants to hear the three angels' messages. Let them hear them anyway. We don't do what we do to please men and women. We do what we do to please God. Come on and say amen today. Does this thing work? That's a question many people have asked of their faith in God. I'll ask you, does faith in God work for you? Okay, challenger. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, if any man or woman is in Christ, that person's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. Okay, faith works if you're, if you're new. And don't get confused. New does not mean Enoch. Enoch grew and grew and grew and grew and walked with God. But new can mean you just came into the church smelling like a, a, a long night out, covered up in stuff that doesn't look Christian at all, but you're new because you met Jesus and you gave Jesus your heart. So somewhere between that guy and Enoch, that's all new, you understand. 
So is faith making you new? Are you being renewed every day? Giving God your heart every day. Yielding to God every day. Growing every day. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. He said, you must be born again. And sometimes we can hear that and say, oh, that's a requirement. No, 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 no. That's a privilege. Nicodemus, i got news for you. I got, brother, you, you can be born again. I can? Yes, you can. I don't know what that means, but tell me more. This is a privilege Jesus has communicated. He's saying, you may be born again. He's saying, this thing works. You don't have to stay how you are. You don't have to stay stuck in your sin. It doesn't matter how overwhelming that sin seems. You don't have to stay discouraged. You may be born again and made new through Jesus. There is joy in being a Christian believer. God said, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. See, if you connect yourself with Jesus, God will do that in your life. And you don't have to live with guilt. The guilt of being a failure. The guilt of running back to your sin like a dog returning to its vomit. You don't have to live with that. You can live liberated. Christ has delivered me. Yes, I may not quite be everything that I ought to be, but I am growing. I've been made new. I have received a new heart, and I'm leaning in the direction of Jesus. He is leaning in the direction of me. That's the Christian experience. Matthew 13, 44. Kingdom of heaven, like treasure hidden in a field. A man, when he finds it, he hides it, and for the joy thereof, goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Friend, come on. Our faith in Christ has got to work. We were just in England recording some television programs. We did two, uh, one about Bunyan and one about Mueller and two about John Newton. You know, in researching to write that program. I discovered it was said, John Newton, once a slave trader, later the man who wrote Amazing Grace, could swear constantly for 30 minutes without ever repeating himself. Now that's so good at being bad, you, you almost got to admire the guy. I say that flippantly. But Newton met Jesus. Stopped using profanity. Worked with William Wilberforce to end slavery throughout the British Empire. Became a minister of the gospel. Then he went from using offensive words to writing a collection of some of the most now famous words in the entire English language. When he said Amazing Grace saved a wretch like him, he was not kidding. That brother was wretched. But Jesus got a hold of his life, turned him around. He was saved. He was made new. He was transformed. That encourages a wretch like me. If God can do that for him, God can do that for me as well. Does this thing work? Oh, yes. Grace, friend, works. It worked for Newton. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Yes, it works. Faith in God works. Sure it works. Does church work? Let me ask you that question. Oh, I'll tell you what. If you have a positive attitude, it'll work even better than it's working now. Oh, pastor, you ought to hear the preaching we have to put up with. Well, pray, pray. <laughs> Just pray. I'm not sure if, that, if the chuckling is that was humorous or you're like, oh, he's in on, he understands. I don't know. But what you're doing is you are praying as you sit to listen. You are praying for the preacher. You are praying knowing that, that, that you are feeding on the word every day anyway. And you're praying saying to yourself, you know, the preacher has four churches. Had a funeral this week. Had a board meeting. Had to go to the conference office for something. Probably didn't have more than five minutes to pull a sermon together. So you are being gracious. And what you're saying is, hey, pastor. What can we do to lighten your load a little bit? What can we do? Why in the world are you cutting the grass at the church and cleaning the windows and emptying the trash can? What are you doing that for? We'll do that, Pastor. Why are you running around doing some of this stuff? We'll do that. Why are you taking care of Sabbath school supplies? We'll do that. The pastor should have as little to do as possible. So the pastor can then focus on what's absolutely important. You know, I've been in Africa. These places where pastor has 30 churches. How much does the pastor do at the local church? Kind of nothing. 
rolls in every couple of months, has a meeting, baptizes a gaggle of people and walks off and leaves the people to run the church. I know it's different. I know that there in many cases, that the, the, it's an agrarian economy. The people got a little more time on their hands. I understand that. Now, we don't have to be Africa, but we can be Christian and we can work and we can understand the principles. Let's get our shoulders to the wheel and contribute and commit and be part of this thing. Friend, we cannot just go through the motions. We got to be all in as a living sacrifice. Does prayer work? Oh, come on now. Yes, it works. How about we pray like we believe it works? Pray great big prayers. Pray that the Lord will work miracles. Don't let him off the hook until he does. I will not let you go until you bless me. That's going to be our prayer from now on. And I would say this. We are talking about evangelism. I don't know what happens in your local church. But there, there are precious few churches that actually pray for church growth. Precious few. When did you last say, okay, Wednesday night, 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock, we're going to gather for 30 minutes at the church to pray that the church grows? You pray that you'll start praying other prayers like, Lord, I need to be doing something to help the church to grow. I don't have time to tell you this, so I'll tell you anyway. A lady I know told me about her church, four people attending. They were all elderly. She realized there were one or two funerals away from not existing. The four got together. They said, this cannot go on. Folks are dying and people move away. There's four of us. And there's people in the community. What are we going to do? Well, we don't know. None of us are experts. They hadn't attended. It is written school of evangelism training. Salt. There was even before salt came into existence. You ought to think about going there or sending somebody there. Change lives. Change your church. Change your community. But it was before salt. They said, well, we should pray. And they started to pray. Lord, grow our church. They're praying, they're praying, they're not seeing anything, but they're praying. One day the lady is at the supermarket shopping, and as she's pushing her shopping cart around, somebody she does not know walks right up to her. Shh, you're a Christian, aren't you? Yes, I am. Would you teach me how to be a Christian? Would you help me understand the Bible? A Bible study was born right there. Husband is a physician, he's seeing patients. A patient says, Doc, you're a Seventh-day Adventist, aren't you? I am. How did you know? I've always wanted to know what Seventh-day Adventists believe. Would you teach me? When the church went from four to 15, now I'd like you to think about that. That's the same as going from 100 to 400, just about. It's like from going from 40 to 150. When they went from four to 15, they said, man, we've got we to get a baptistry. We've got to have some baptisms around here. So they called 1-800-BAPTISTRIES and had somebody deliver a baptistry to them, a little portable one like this. Guy off, drove a thousand miles, he's on the back of his pickup. He gets the thing out, helps him in the church, he says, what is this? Well, it's a baptistry. What's a baptistry? They explain, oh, well, why would somebody want to do that? They said, hey, would you like to study the Bible with us? They started correspondence studies, mailing them lessons, getting them back, grading them, mailing them lessons. Three, four, five months later, that brother got back in his truck, drove a thousand miles, and was baptized in the baptistry that he had delivered several months earlier. Church growth, ladies and gentlemen. And how did it happen? Because they prayed, and prayer works. Does evangelism work? Now, you might be thinking public evangelism. You were right. You might be thinking personal evangelism. You were right about that. But the tract that you don't share doesn't win a single soul. I was talking to a man recently. I said, how did you guys come into church? He said, my grandfather was at a railroad station. Saw something blowing along the, the platform right there. It was a tract of some kind. He picked it up. And that was it. It was Adventist. He studied the Bible. And generations now, because somebody shared a tract that maybe then was thrown away. I don't know. Maybe they dropped it. This book ain't going to help anybody. Won't help a soul. Not while it sits here. But if you will share it with somebody. My brother gave me this book once, the, the, the full version. I did not read it. Four years later, he gave it to me again. I did not read it. Four years later, I wrote him a letter. I said, Wayne, I am searching. 
What was that book you gave me? Where could I find it? A couple of weeks after that, third copy showed up in my mailbox. I read it that time, called the operator, asked for the phone number of the Seventh-day Adventist Cathedral, and as a result, I am here today. I got educated along the way. How was I to know Adventists didn't have cathedrals? I didn't know that. Evangelism works. You share. I, people tell me, look, I've been doing the same thing for years and years and years and years and nothing's happened. No, no wrong. Nothing's happened that you've seen. That you've seen. Huh? Cole Porter in Washington, D.C. stopped at the home of a single parent. I got some books. She didn't have any money for that. But he said, I can leave you this book for just a couple of dollars. She gave him a couple of dollars and got a book called Bible Readings for the Home. Took it upstairs, put it in the attic, forgot all about it. Years later, years later, her son is fossicking around in that attic. Finds that book, Bible Q&A. Wow, this is interesting. Mother, where'd you get that book? I don't know, some guy came by here years ago. That brother went on to become a PhD and teach in one of our schools. He's a friend of mine. Come on now, say amen. amen. It works. Evangelism works. Conduct an evangelistic meeting. Well, pastor, you don't understand. Our area is kind of tough. All right. Do you know that Jesus is kind of tough? Angels are kind of tough. We had a meeting and baptized two people. I'm saying praise the Lord. Have another one. Baptize two more. In 10 years, you done baptized 20 people. And they've raised their kids. And they've done some witnessing themselves. And your 20 has turned into 30 or 40 or 100 or doesn't even matter. You are just doing what you do and sharing what you share. Come on now, let God do his work. The evangelistic meeting that isn't held is an evangelistic meeting that doesn't work. Evangelism works. You're going to hold meetings, show up, help out, contribute, greet some folks, pray with people, pray for people. That sounds like a lot of work. When you get to heaven, you are going to rue the fact that you didn't do more of that. There'll only be a half a dozen people who get to heaven and go, Whew. The rest of us, we're going to get to heaven, hang our heads a little bit and say, we could have done more. We could have done more. We could have done so much more. Ladies and gentlemen, it works. Faith works. Christ works. Great grace works. Prayer works. Evangelism works. It all works. That's why God gave it to us. And he says to us, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men challenges friend we go through life distracted and i mentioned that to be half in the church and half in the world means that you're basically all in the world and we're missing opportunities you know you do that bible study and somebody is baptized that just change your life change your church you change your family you get excited about that sort of thing oh we don't need to go into all the difficulties well john i'm so shy and uh, no one in my town wants to know. Well, neither are true. But what you do is you just pray. Lord, bring somebody to me. Or bring me to somebody. Lord, undoubtedly there are people that are interested. If you could, would you help me to connect with them? Let, I, I'm one of the each one. And so therefore I want to do what? Please. Yes. And God will use you for that. What an incredible thing. You know there have been people, great people in this world. Marie Curie and Michael Faraday and Thomas Alva Edison and Nikola Tesla. He invented the electric car. Did you know that? Great people. He did not invent the electric car. <laughs> and they've done incredible things. Jonas Salk, Neil Armstrong. But I'm promising you. That when you get to heaven, that humble person who shared her faith or his faith will, re, will be regarded throughout eternity as having done something infinitely greater than the greatest human scientist, than Einstein or anybody else. Come on now, we're going to go from camp meeting focused. 
We're going to focus on the Bible and we're going to drink it in. We're going to focus on heaven knowing that God is drawing us there. We're going to focus on our community and we're going to say, Lord, there must be people saved out of this community. You're going to drive by a trailer park and say, got to be somebody in there. Law of averages suggests there has to be somebody in there. You drive past a gated community, got to get us in there somehow, Lord. Teach us how to get in there. You're going to walk into church and do a head count. Hmm, 17. 37 62 there's room for more come on lord fill these pews for your glory not ours for his glory so when we get to heaven there'll be a greater reunion than we could even have contemplated yes this works it'll work if you allow it to work for it is god which worketh in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure I wrote a devotional a couple of years ago. They wondered what I should title it. I said, call it the hope of glory. Well, why would you do that? Because Colossians 1 verse 27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the key. We just got to get him in. That's the hope of glory. Allow him in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Just open the door and let Jesus come in. Where's our focus today? Come to camp meeting thinking about all the wrong things sometimes. Not now. We're looking towards heaven. Waiting for the return of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. 2007 Chicago Marathon. There was a surprise. Towards the end of the women's marathon event. And, and a Romanian athlete named Adriana Pertia was winning the women's marathon. It was her first ever marathon. She'd never won one before. And where were the Africans? No one could explain. Some of them were injured, I guess. They said the heat affected some. Here was a Romanian woman leading. The, the winner the, the previous year was an Ethiopian runner named Bohane Adere. And she was nowhere to be found. And Miss Pertia was running towards the finish line. She's along Columbus Drive. That's the, the last stretch of the Chicago Marathon. And, Kathy Switzer, really a, a marathon running legend now. She was one of the commentary team and she said, this will be a day that she'll remember the rest of her life. Oh, that's true. I'm sure she contemplated that day every day for many, many days. As she was running towards the finish line, somebody said to her, you are the winner. Nobody is near you. And unfortunately, she believed them. If you watch the video, she's running towards the finish line. She's beaming. She's relaxed. The crowd is big. They are cheering. And she starts waving to the crowd. She's running along and, and the camera's following her up Columbus Drive. She starts high-fiving people in the crowd. But then the camera turns and looks back down Columbus Drive. And here's Adriana Pertia. But further down, rounding the bend, here's Bohane Adere. And she didn't know how far behind she was. But now she realizes there's the leader and there's the finish line. And the leader's not looking at the finish line. Oh, the Ethiopian runner realized this was her chance. She moved out wide on Columbus Drive. I don't know why exactly. Maybe so that Patia couldn't hear her footsteps as she came running. She moved out wide on Columbus Drive and she just turned on the afterburners. And she sprinted like she'd never sprinted before. How you sprint after 26 miles of running, I don't quite know. But God bless her, she did. And there's the Romanian, smiling, waving, high-fiving. And then there's this moment when the waving, uh, uh, the waving Romanian realizes... Just yards from glory. Just yards. Now, the Chicago Marathon's a big one. It's kind of like the U.S. Open in golf. It's, it's kind of one of the majors. And she had a chance to win one of the big ones. First time out. But because she wasn't focused, she lost her opportunity. And the Ethiopian runner who was laser focused on the finish line sprinted by her with just a few yards to go and won the Chicago Marathon. Adriana Pertia did not come second because she was the less superior athlete. She didn't come second because she couldn't win. She didn't come second because she wasn't fast enough. She finished second because she wasn't focused. 
Friend of God, I want to appeal to you today to focus. To take your Bible and read your Bible. To take the spirit of prophecy and read and feed on those incredible words. I want you today to be a person who has faith, who looks towards the heavens and says, Yes, God can. Yes, God will. I want you to consider today what Jesus could do in your life. You've been feeling like a failure. But God says, oh, no, 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 no. Let me have your heart and I'll make it new. I could drag this out or I could not do it at all. But I decided today that I would give somebody the opportunity to give their heart to Jesus. Would you stand? Everybody, would you stand? Let's do this quickly. I know you've been waiting to stretch your legs, but if you would stand. As Laura plays, I just want to ask if there's somebody here today who's far from God. You haven't been focused. You want to be in the heart of God. I'm going to invite you to come forward. I'm not asking everybody. You came here today fully committed to Jesus and things are okay. And I'd like you to stay where you are and pray. But there's someone here today who hasn't been walking with Jesus. You might never have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, I'm inviting you to join me down here. We're going to pray for you and commit you to heaven. And then you get to leave this place knowing you made a decision for Jesus. Undoubtedly, there is someone today. You know it's not all right between me and Jesus. It might be something you've been holding back. There might be something back there in your mind, in your life, that you want Jesus to take away. Today, it might be that you've never committed, you've never been baptized, or you've never fully surrendered to Jesus, and you'd like to do that. God bless you. And I know there are others. I would hope that there is a pastor or two who would come forward just to meet people as they come. And I would ask you not to bother looking around and worrying about what people think. This isn't theater. But in the stillness of this place, this is God speaking to you and saying, I want you to know salvation and freedom and peace and the security of understanding that your life and Christ's life are one. Would you be one with Jesus today? If there's somebody who came to camp meeting today and you know that in your heart, it's not all right between you and Jesus. There are some people, oh, you look so good on the outside, but you know that on the inside you're living a lie. You want that to end. You want to be the genuine article. Well, you've not been taking your faith seriously. You've been further from God than you want to be. I'm not going to wait too long. We've taken perhaps enough time, but I need to wait. Heaven would have me wait a moment longer. So that one of the sons or daughters of Jesus who've been waiting would come back to him today. If you're way in the back or you're on the periphery, there's time for you. If you're in the middle of a row, no one's going to mind letting you out so that you can come down here and join us that we might pray for you and pray very sincerely and commit you to God that you go from this place one with Jesus made new you don't go from this place wondering you know there are too many of us we wonder about salvation we hope that heaven is ours and I don't want you wondering or hoping because Jesus doesn't he wants you believing that you are in a saving relationship with him and that through Christ you have eternal life there's another here somewhere maybe there's a married couple they want to come together Maybe a child and a parent. Maybe you could go to somebody now and say, I'll take you. Come with me. Let's go to Jesus together. Not everybody's comfortable about making that journey, that short walk on their own. It's just a few yards. And these might be the few yards you need to walk to walk into the arms of Jesus. Is Christ calling you? Don't hesitate. Don't let your feet stay stuck to the floor. Allow Jesus to have you and lead you and own you and fill you. God bless you, sister. Is it just one more? Could be two more. Could be ten more. You come to Jesus now. We'll close with prayer. We'll thank God for your decision. And we'll go from camp meeting this year saying, God, it's got to work. I want it to work in my life. And I'm not going to let you go. 
until you bless me and bless me and bless me some more friend one day soon we'll get to look up together we'll say lo this is our God we have waited for him and he will save us this is the Lord we will rejoice and be glad in his salvation if you're not certain you pray that prayer when Jesus comes back come join us here we'll pray a prayer for you now and commit you to the heart of Christ God bless you God bless you and maybe one more you can even come while we pray but we must extend the invitation today even if there were one even if there were none we'll invite so that if God is calling you you bring your heart to him today come on and let's pray together our Father and our God in Jesus name we come to you thankful today for the blessed gift of salvation thank you for eternal life thankful we are thankful for camp meeting we can come together and allow you to challenge us a little bit speak to our hearts allow us to hear from you that you would gladly take all of us if we would surrender all we are I want to pray today for that one who's hesitating not sure now there are numerous people here today who are sure they're right with you I celebrate that I'm praying for that one that's not sure they know they're not quite right they're holding something back Lord would you encourage that man that woman that young person to right now hold nothing back and not to stay back but to come in faith to a loving Savior friend there's still time for you to make a decision that you can look back on and know I have decided to follow Jesus and now father we pray for those who've come forward asking that your blessing would rest upon them praying that heaven will be near appealing to you to speak words of encouragement and hope and faith into their lives that they will know at every step of their onward journey that they are children of the heavenly king whatever their burdens their weaknesses their concerns whatever their family situation whatever their failings their victories we thank you that grace your grace is sufficient and we thank you that salvation is in the here and now real and theirs we're looking forward to seeing each one in heaven bless us now dear Lord we pray we thank you as we sing our closing hymn let the angels sing with us we're gonna celebrate the joy of having the assurance that one day soon we'll get to heaven let that day come sooner than we could even hope we pray with thanks in Jesus name amen if you've come forward speak to the pastor we want to speak with you and know what your concerns are at your contact information if we need it and thank God for you in the meantime I'll turn it over to Elder Bailey and I know we have a closing hymn to sing <laughs>